Okay, quick video today, just um, down in the speed shop, putting new chain and sprockets on all the CT125s. I've got some posty bike days where I take people out on these. We'll do some trails later this week. And uh, they're all ready for chain and sprockets. We'll do about 5,000 kilometers or so. Make sure that's in sight, yep. Yeah, they've all done about 5,000 kilometers or so, which to be honest is not too bad for the OEM chain and sprockets on these bikes. The sprockets are probably all right for a bit longer, uh, but the chains are definitely stretched out a little bit. I've actually been quite impressed with the quality of the chains. I think the worst one I've ever ridden was a, a Suzuki Van Van 200, which um, I took around Cornwall when they first came out back in 2016, and that, that chain was, was stretching every 200 miles. There was barely anything left in it after 1,500 miles, so for these to last... 5,000 kilometers, which is still only 3,000 miles. It's pretty good. I mean, it's not great, but um, it's better than, than probably what I expected. All in all, these CT125s have been, they've stood up to more abuse than I thought. They've been, they've been on fleet for two years, so I've been running them with people to come down and ride for two years, which is pretty, a pretty hard life. I mean, they've not, nobody's, thankfully, touched wood, uh, had any big prangs on them or anything. They get dropped regularly, but everything's still intact. There's nothing that's broken off it. There's a bit of paintwork that's just got a, just a bit of scuffing just on here. The paint's certainly not very thick on this rear rack. Right? That wears off. And the exhaust guards are quite vulnerable and expensive to replace, about 140, 150 for the exhaust guards. So the best thing you can do to protect your exhaust, if, if you've got one of these, is to buy one of those hoops from AliExpress or one of the Thai suppliers of, of components. But uh, all in all, yeah, the bikes, the bikes have, have actually stood up to the abuse better than I thought they would. When they first came up, came, uh, from Seven Seas, we got them from Seven Seas up in Dewsbury, who's been the main importer of these. Um, when they first rolled out the van, I was kind of thinking, oh, they're not going to last very long. And one of the big issues with these is that the idea was to run them back to back with a fleet of 110s, and they've got the old, the original Aussie post bikes. But on, on these, neutrals at the top, first is down, second is down, third is down, fourth is down, third is up, second is up, first is up. So it's, it's a, I guess it could, I would call it an Asian stacked gearbox. Um, allegedly, for people who were riding in flip-flops, the CT110s are, are, are conventional, i.e. neutral at the bottom, first up, first, second up, third up, fourth up. So the, the thought of letting people ride both bikes back to back soon went out the window because obviously the gearboxes had taken absolute battering if they were jumping on from one to another and the gearboxes were differently, uh, oppositely, um, set up, configured. Um, but, but no, no, they've been, they've been good. Parts have not needed much. Tires have lasted pretty well running these Kenda 26, K262s on them on the rear and on the front, a three inch on the, on the rear and a 275 on the front. That seems to be pretty good. I mean, the bike's still not officially imported by Honda UK or Honda Europe. Uh, and from uh, latest uh, news updates at Seven Seas Market, Seven Seas in Dewsbury can't get any more of these because the entire supply that are being built in Thailand are being shipped to supply the American market. So it's only the Americans who are now getting uh, these bikes. Uh, as to why Honda never brought these into the UK, Europe, I mean, legislation is, is said to be one of the reasons. I know somebody at the bike show, a Honda representative came around having a look at one of, one of my bikes, one of these that I took to the show. And, he was sort of saying about the location of the indicators and uh, eight rear ABS and things like that. But nothing really substantial to justify this not being imported, you know, in the, in the way that the C125 is or the Monkey is or the DAX is. Obviously, there was a, a policy decision, however many years ago, that the UK, Europe simply weren't going to get the CT125. And irrespective and despite the amount of demand that there's been, I think Honda and the Japanese way of doing business is that inflexible. They can't respond to that demand and make any changes to their planned strategy that they put in place seven, 10 years ago as to what it was. Uh, I mean, when I got back from my Sydney to London trip on one of the CT110s, you know, this is going back like eight, nine years or so, um, Honda invited myself, Ian Coates and Ed March. Ian Coates is a guy who went around the world on the Africa Twin for like 16 years. Ed March is a guy who's done loads of C90 stuff and is recently doing the Jeeps in Moab um, YouTube series. Uh, so we all went out there and it was a bit of an expensive spade jolly to thank us for being ambassadors for Honda. And we sat around the corporate table with the, the head honchos of, of Honda Europe. Uh, and it was interesting 
I mean, I had done business at university, so I was kind of interested in that side of things. Uh, and, and what they were saying is, or, or what, they, w w what was accepted practice was to have seven-year policies, seven-year bike product plans and, and, and ranges. So it would be seven, eight, nine years prior to this that they were deciding whether Europe were going to get it. And I think what it means is, and what we can see today is that Jap Japan manufacturers are quite inflexible and incapable of quickly adapting to, to changing uh, trends in society, trends in motorcycling. So uh, I think that's why we've not got this, simply because in a board meeting somewhere in Japan, 10 years ago, somebody never thought that the Europeans would buy a CT125, which I think is probably the biggest shame because I mean, used this bike and used it to ride the ACT in the, in the, in the UK back in April, and also obviously ridden one of the four bearers of this, the 110, around the world, Sydney to London, New York to Alaska. You know, this is the ultimate practical, usable motorcycle. Like, it can do everything. It might, might not do it very fast or very powerfully, but with 8.6 horsepower, whatever it's got, it will take you and your luggage wherever you want to go. It will go off road, it will ride on the street, it will ride around town, it will do it very economically, it will do it very reliably, and it will do it in comfort. Like it's got every virtue of a good usable day-to-day -day motorcycle. Uh, and I, I think I just, I can't, I can't understand the oversight and not realize it. And I, I think that's, you know, I've touched on, on that Vogue video that, that motorcycling has become like a premium and accessory lifestyle choice. And I think the reason that motorcycling is, is dwindling, is fading away, is because they've failed to make the bikes practical for people who aren't motorcyclists, but they appreciate the usability of two-wheel transport. So you, know, you, you don't have to be a motorcycle to appreciate what this can do if you're a commuter, or if you want to go out and explore the back roads of your own country or the, back, or, or the countryside. Uh, and so I think in the last probably 20 years, 30 years, motorcycling has become about performance and pace. And I think they lost sight of the fact that actually it started out as a practical means of transport. And what Honda did with this, this reincarnation of the, the Cub Trail, is make the ultimate perfect reincarnation of it and then failed to sell it to the people who wanted to buy it. So it's, it's kind of frustrating because they built it, but then never sold it or didn't sell it or build it in enough numbers to, to satisfy or, or ignite a spark that could have brought new people to motorcycling and, and I, I find it really frustrating. I think as well, you know, you kind of got to wonder, I've talked a bit about the Vogue in previous videos, you know, the, the, the emergence of China. Now, I think China's coming strong because they're learning to copy and copy very well Japanese products, which are increasingly easy to copy. There's nothing uncopyable about this. It's a, very basic engine with a very basic chassis and a very basic wheel configuration. It's an easy product to copy. There's nothing innovative about it. The original CTs were very innovative. There was loads of features, dual transmission gearbox, the turn handlebars so you could line them up with the frame so you get them on the back of a camper van. Loads of innovative features which are no longer on modern motorcycles, which has allowed the Chinese to replicate, copy, improve in some cases and undercut. And you kind of think, where is, the electric, where is Honda's electric version of this? You know, if Honda could come out with an electric version of this that could do 50 miles an hour with an 150 mile range, maybe the tech's not there yet, maybe they're working on it, but that is where Honda, the innovators that we know them to be, certainly in the past, that's where, to me, they, they, they need to start pushing technology that is hard to copy, or at least has is, is got more barriers to copy or barriers to entry. So, Great bike. It's a fucking great bike. I love owning them. They've been great, reliable, dutiful machines where people have come down here and you could put your granny on one of these and take a green lane in and she would have the ride of her life. You know, they're that good at taking novice riders off road. You know, you talk, people talk about Himalayan, CRF, Cerros. Nothing gets as easy to ride off road as something like this with a clutchless gearbox. Can't stall it. Concentrate on the throttle, get your feet down easy, nice and low. You know, perfect, perfect, perfect bikes. And uh, yeah, and, and in fairness, lasting well as well. So all I would say is, um, as a criticism of Honda, and I guess I do have a down on Honda, and the reason is they seem to be um, designing in complication rather than simplicity. Like this rear spindle mount, 
and, and, and uh, tension plate and all this. It's just so bloody painful to use and to fit and to put the wheel back in. Same with the air box. It's got loads of little invisible clips underneath the plastics and those little pop-up rivet plastic things that you have to push and then it pull it out. So much fiddly design in what should be a very simple usable machine. So that would be my only gripe with whoever designed this. And it's clear that they didn't design it with people with blue gloves in a industrial estate in Devon in mind, they made it hard to work on. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why, because the CT110 is, is butter to work on. It's absolutely simple. Bolt, nut, screw, off, back on, air filter, easy, valves, easy, wheel out, easy. You can detect the wheel out in the dark. I did one of these, I did a chain set and rear assembly earlier today. It must have took me a bloody good hour and so to get that back wheel in. Pain in the backside. So that'd be it. So CT125, they'll be ready to go for Thursday. I've got five people coming down to ride them. We're gonna have a good old time. It's gonna be muddy, it's gonna be wet, but that makes it more exciting. So I'll crack on. I won't show you the boring, because it's quite easy actually. Four bolts on your rear sprocket, two on your front, chain off. Bish bosh, bish bash bosh. On we go, right, I'll crack on, leave me to it, cheers.